Welcome back inside the ESPN Wide World of Sports Grill. I'm Andy Katz from ESPN. I've got three new coaches here, two in blue. <laughs> Blaine Taylor from Old Dominion. You may not recognize him because for the first time since he was a small child, <laughs> around five years old, he no longer has a mustache. <laughs> Leonard Hamilton, who has not aged at all. Uh, I think he was first coaching in the early 60s from Florida State. Wow. And Jim Barron from Rhode Island, who's gotten a little bit of gray. <laughs> who has a mustache. <laughs> yes, who has a mustache. <laughs> Did you take that from Blaine? No, no, no. It's just a thing I had over the years, and I, I loved uh, having it. And uh, being at Rhode Island, it's a great place to have a mustache. <laughs> what do you remember of Blaine Taylor's mustache? Well, i tell you what. You know, on the court, winning 20-plus games every year, uh, he's done a great job at Old Dominion. It's a great program, and uh, it's a great league, as you know. It's just like the Atlantic 10. Do you recognize him? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Terrific well, coach. When I first grew that mustache about 30 years ago, they said it looked like a football game, 11 on each side. And then it filled in like yours. But grass doesn't grow on a busy street. Look at Leonard's head. See? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I've now, got to, I have to. Uh, my hair gives me trouble in the morning. So no, I keep no, brushing. No, no, no. Look at the video here. Oh, my goodness. First wow. of all, not only does he have a mustache, his hair is dark. This is like extreme makeover here. Yeah, You've yeah. got no mustache, and your hair is light. What well, happened in the summer well me and me and calipari we got a two for one there at the cosmetology <laughs> school so i just kind of caught up behind john <laughs> <laughs> all right let's stay on a, a little bit of this theme um vcu and butler go to the final four this past season butler two seasons in a row 2006 george mason made it how much of a trend do we have now where schools outside of the power six can crack the final four well, the, the tournament's fickle in that it's one and done, so the bracketing and the matchups are huge. Uh, but I think what's happening is you have the guys leaving for the pros, and the advantage that some schools have is continuity. You're looking at uh, fifth-year seniors sometimes. You're looking at teams that have been together for years, and that closes the gap and makes it a more level playing field. We've experienced, but many people have. Well, I think, uh, you know, a lot of it is what Blaine said is, you know, teams are getting better. I think teams are getting better and uh, coaches have done an excellent job. And uh, I think the players have gotten better, you know, really have developed and, uh, you know, they got something to prove. And I know in the Atlantic 10, you know, we're a league that, uh, you know, don't, we look at it sometimes that it's a great league. You have 14 teams. You got teams and you had Phil Martelli on and, you know, you got great coaches and players that are terrific. And, uh, you know, we really put a lot of stock in development and that means a lot to us. I think the maturity of a team has a lot to do with it. And sometimes when you get those fifth-year seniors in there and guys who are around for four years, you know, they, they're playing well. They, they're focused. They've made all the mistakes. They've been there before. And they're giving you great, solid, fundamental play down the stretch. At the beginning of the show, we talked about uh, the stipend in college basketball. And there certainly was a lot of interesting opinions, certainly from John Calipari on this issue. We've got a good cross-section of schools here. How feasible is it? to offer up some sort of compensation in some form to all student athletes? I think it's going to be very difficult. Uh, we have a needed fund. Obviously, the Pell Grant has been very beneficial to a lot of youngsters who maybe might need some extra money. But it's, I don't know whether it's cost, it might be cost prohibitive, you know, to be able to equally fund every athlete on campus. I'm not real sure whether that money is available uh, for, for all athletes. And I'm not sure you could, uh, could verify or uh, you could give it to basketball players and football players and not necessarily to all the other best all the other student athletes what do you think well i think uh, i think there's no problem with doing that and I, I say that because the responsibility that student athletes have uh they're not allowed to to get jobs i mean people say well you can get a job but they don't have enough time to work <laughs> to be a regular student athlete because of the responsibilities that us as coaches, our trainers, our programs, we put a lot of responsibility on them, and then we want them to graduate. You know, we graduate all our student athletes at Rhode Island, and so we want them to go to study table. We want them to go to class. So, you know, to have a stipend, I, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with them being able to compensate, you know, for what they do as student athletes in the classroom and How on much? the court. Well, I, you know, I mean, who's going to determine that? But I think something between two and three thousand dollars is nothing wrong. A year. A year, because again, you know, these kids come from different types of families where they don't have, you know, the the, the, the automatic 
checks coming in from their families. Uh, and, and again, they have a lot of responsibility to be student athletes. And uh, like Leonard has said, the Pell Grant is something that's very important. Uh, student athlete assistance program that we have in the Atlantic 10 is important. But you want them to be student athletes, you know, so to, to be able to do that. We have some foreign kids on our program, on our team. So, you know, they're not allowed to, to have jobs outside because of their responsibility. To be student athletes is something that's very, very prominent for us. How do you think, where do you think the money would come from for us to be able to fund well, this type of program? You know, let me tell you something. There's a lot of money out there. Okay. I mean, you look at the Final Four every single year, and that arena is packed. You look at the CBS package, TV packages that we have, you know, with college basketball. I mean, there's a lot of money out there. And, again, I don't think there's anything wrong to divvy some of that up. And, again, it's not for just men's basketball. I think it's for women's basketball. I think it's for all student athletes. Boy, they both said a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like to be in your halftime speeches. Uh, you probably missed tip. Uh, but <laughs> uh, they, they said a lot of good things. The, the job nature, these kids don't have a lot of extra time so as Jim alludes to it's very demanding and they don't have enough money for laundry and some of the necessary items that you have day to day the where does the money come from who do you give it to you know uh, Leonard is speaking to how do you do it equitably it's easy to come up with these problems but the solutions boy it's not going to be easy to zero in on on where you stop and where you stop or with 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 uh, certain teams certain kids certain sports uh, how much money I'd like to see it done by the athletic department and not people make value judgments. You 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 get it, you don't. Right. You get it, you uh, don't. No From what I understand, it would be by a conference <laughs> by conference decision. So if the Ivy chooses not to do it, they would not. So from the CAA, would it be feasible? We're a great example to look at. We have uh, probably half the schools that generate a lot of revenue that would probably say, yeah, we'd be open-minded to it. But we also play 1AA football, which doesn't isn't quite the cash cow that 1A football is. And then you probably have some schools that would sit in meetings and say, we absolutely are trying to operate what we are right now, and we can't afford to do it. So, so we're a good you know, kind of a mi microcosm of what the country represents. So is the A-10, though. Yeah, there's no question. But like I said, I, I think there's nothing wrong with, with doing that and, and uh, you know, giving them some compensation because, again, being student athletes and the regimentation and the responsibility that they have, and, and for us, they all do it. So, you know, their expectations are coming in. They don't have a lot of time on their hand to, you know, to get a job. But, Andy, uh, I agree that if it's possible and if you can find a way that we could, could help the youngsters out, I'd be all for it. I just want to figure out how can we physically do this? Where would the money come from? I'm not real sure the dollars are available for 500 athletes on, on a campus. All right, well, before look, we look. go real quick, before we go, I want, I want to make sure we get this really in here. How does Old Dominion, we're going to shift gears real quickly here, two quick ways Old Dominion gets back to the NCAA tournament and wins the CAA. Well, you got to have marquee players, and uh, we've got some seniors coming up that could be the winningest class in the history of the school. Last year's was, but they could pass that. Then we've got to go back to the basics. We were the, the, the number one ranked rebounding team in the country. We were third in the country in scoring. So we got to go back to the basics, we got to do it with good players. Florida State, how do you challenge North Carolina Duke to win the ACC? We feel good about our basketball team returning. We think we have experience. We have guys who've been there before. We felt disappointed that we didn't go farther last year. Uh, we have a, a veteran team. Uh, I think we want, need to stay healthy. If we can stay healthy and continue to keep improving, taking that next step, I think we're going to have an opportunity to compete against the two big boys in our league, that being North Carolina and Duke. Now, Phil Martelli said Saint, uh, Xavier could be a sleeper Final Four team, so let's take them out of the mix. How does URI finish in that top four? Well, we graduated four very, very good players. We ended up winning 90 games, the most in the history of the school. Uh, we got a lot of youngsters coming in, but we got to grow up real quick because we got a great schedule early on. So, uh, you know, we're going to have to have our upperclassmen and our youngsters really come together quickly. All right, well, thanks for joining me. Jim Barron from URI, Leonard Hamilton from Florida State, Blaine Taylor with... I guess sort of sandy blonde hair, yeah, no mustache kind of clean from Old look. Dominion. <laughs> Thanks for joining us here. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. So long from the ESPN Wide World of Sports Complex in Florida.